Good morning, or I should say good afternoon, everyone. I'm Alan Pennington. I'm a waste reduction coordinator for Marion County Environmental Services. And we have a special uh, webinar for you folks today, the 2020 Framework for Action. Um, this is webinar is being recorded. It will later appear on YouTube. So those of you who missed something or would like to see it again, you can certainly go there and find it. I will be sending out that information later once it gets posted. And um, I just want you to know that if you have questions, you can send, you can put them in the chat, write them in the chat if you, when you think of them, or you can save it to the end. Also, there will be time to ask Jordan questions about the 2020 framework, because I think you're gonna find it uh, pretty interesting. So, um, I, uh, again, appreciate you being here today. And uh, Jordan, I would like to introduce you. Jordan Palmieri is a senior policy analyst and materials management program at the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality, where he coordinates projects around the built environment, life cycle assessments, and purchasing. Jordan's been with DEQ for 14 years. His early work focused on environmental site cleanup, improving water quality, and reducing toxics in water bodies. He then shifted reducing the life cycle impacts of materials and products with a particular focus on building materials. He's worked on building and zoning codes and served as a technical and policy expert for small housing initiative. Is, there's a plural there. He's advised local, regional, and global green building rating systems and leads a program to help Oregon concrete producers develop environmental product declarations or EPDs. And I hope that you'll talk about that at some time today, Jordan as to what that might be. And he has a, a MS, a Master's of Science in Environmental Science from Tulane University, deep in the heart of Louisiana. Jordan, thank you so much for being here today. And um, it's, uh, it's great having you and willing to take the time because I know you are a busy guy up there at DEQ. So let's get started. What is this 20, well, first of all, you, you, the, the title there says 2020 framework for action, but then underneath it, it says 2050 vision for vision for materials management. And if that, if I do my math right, that's 30 years away. So I think you've got a lot to explain for yourself, sir. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for having me, Alan. Really appreciate it. Um, and uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's get into it. It's, it's really hard to talk about the 2020 framework for action uh, without talking about um, Oregon's 2050 vision for materials management. And so, um, you know, when we, when we think about Oregon's 2050 vision, um, you know, we, we, we think about that, it, it's actually a, a, a legislatively required materials management plan that, that Oregon DEQ has the responsibility of putting in together. And uh, it has to look at least 10 years into the future. Um, this is our 2050 vision. Um, it looks well past 10 years and, and all the way to 2050, as you said, a good 30 years down the road. So we, this certainly is a visionary document. Um, and it was adopted uh, by our Environmental Quality Commission in December of 2012. Um, there's three main parts to the plan. Now, the first part of the plan, which you see on uh, the screen here, is the, the actual vision. It's a one-page document that describes what materials management in Oregon will be like in 2050. Now, the vision is aspirational. It's, it's really that ideal state that we're aiming for. The next part of the plan gets a little bit more detailed about, about the 2050 vision. Um, it breaks materials management down into different life cycle stages like production, consumption, end of life. And it really describes what we're aiming for for each of those life cycle stages. And, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in the next slide. And then finally, the, the last part of the plan um, is the framework for action. Now, the, the framework, um, in, in when we wrote this originally in 2012, it outlines a path forward from the reality of 2012 to the desired outcomes of 2050. So the framework for action in itself is this flexible platform that guides progress towards achieving the 2050 vision. Um, so if we think about the, the vision itself as our destination, we could think of the, the framework for action as our map or as our compass. Uh, it, it's how we are aiming to get to the goals of the vision. I just want to say one more thing, um, Alan, and this is, about, uh, this is about some of the desired outcomes. And I, I don't think we talk about this very often because a lot of people just 
think about the, the one page vision statement that we have. Um, but I just wanted to go through a couple of these to give people an idea of the, the level of detail that's in here. You know, this, there's a section of the vision that talks about welcome to 2050. This is how we want 2050 to look. And, you know, we say things like what I've highlighted here, you know, producers make products sustainably. Materials are not used at a faster rate than can be renewed or recovered. Research and innovation fuel unprecedented technological advances. Um, you know, complete and transparent information on product contents and life cycle impacts is readily available. Um, so these are some of the things that we're aiming for. And, and again, our framework for action is our, is, our, is our map on how to get to these. When we decided to update the framework for action, we certainly did take a hard look at some of these desired outcomes for 2050. And um, we, we kind of took the temperature of where we are today. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, we are still pretty far away from what is described as the desired outcomes in 2050. But, you know, we have made some progress on some of these different desired outcomes. Like, when we think about complete and transparent information available in product contents, life cycle impacts are readily available. I know the, the field that I work in most closely, the built environment, we've made a lot of progress um, on that particular desired outcome. Um, we're making more progress on how responsibility is shared um, throughout the life cycle impacts of products. So that is a little bit of an overview of our 2050 vision. And that's, that's also how the, uh, the framework for action fits in. Okay. So you guys have been working on this. You started in uh, back in, in 2012 is when it got approved. Um, so what, what kind of programs have you guys, uh, the, the, the folks there at DEQ, I'm going to quit saying guys here. I'm going to try to be uh, gender neutral. And uh, so the folks in, in, uh, down at DEQ have been doing some stuff. So tell us some of the, the programs that, are, that, that kind of jump out at you that you started that's been in progress for the last eight years. Sure. Yeah, the, the last eight years is a lot to talk about. Um, <coughs> so I'll, I'll try and uh, whip through some of the highlights. I, I did want to show that um, when we did this, you know, we really did uh, look back retrospectively and think about what have we accomplished over the last, at, at the time, this was six to seven years. And um, so we did put together uh, program highlights from 2013 to 2019. This is available on our website. I'm, I'm showing the link here. Um, and it could be found pretty easily. Um, so without going to, through the details of, of this document, I'll, I'll let you all look at that on your own. I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna swing through some, some, some high level highlights on a few different categories of work um, throughout the program. Uh, the first is, is foundational work. Now, when I talk about foundational work, um, we call it foundational because these are the types of projects that greatly influence the other work that we pursue. And in some cases, this foundational work also has a meaningful impact on the work that other organi organizations choose to pursue. Um, so I'm gonna talk briefly about the work in bold here and then skip over the work that's not highlighted in bold just for the sake of time. Um, we, you know, we can't talk about the 2050 vision and, and the growth of materials management in Oregon without talking about Senate bills 245 and 263. You know, these were passed in the 2015 um, Oregon legislative session um, with the help and support of probably many of the folks who uh, are attending this, this webinar today. Um, this was truly a team effort um, throughout Oregon um, that really um, couldn't have been possible without the support of many stakeholders. Um, again, uh, many of whom may be attending today. So thank you to everybody who supported uh, the program. Senate Bill 245 um, did a couple of things. It increased funding for our program, uh, basically increased the solid waste tip fee. Um, and, and it also authorized us to really work fully across the entire life cycle of products and, and, and use our funding to do so. Um, Senate Bill 263 updated the Opportunity to Recycle Act um, and made some important changes there. Um, after Senate Bill 245 and 263, and again, those were in 2015. So um, we spent a good year and a half um, working with over 100 different stakeholders around the state, many different work groups, basically developing these legislative concepts. At the time, our, our staff was still pretty small. Um, so that really took up a lot of our time over 2013 and 2014. Um, once those bills were passed, um, it really did give us a lot more authority to, to be able to staff up 
So we spent quite a bit of time staffing up. We, we literally doubled our staff in our headquarters office and did also pick up a number of regional positions, which was great. Um, we also developed a number of strategic plans over the last six to seven years. Uh, we worked on um, reuse, repair, and product life extension. We worked on preventing the wasting of food. And um, we also developed a strategic plan for reducing toxics in the environment. You know, we're going to see more of these strategic plans come out because our program has really grown considerably over time. Another one I'll highlight besides our research efforts is our consumption-based greenhouse gas inventory. You know, this is another one of these projects that doesn't just influence the work that we do, but it influences other people's work. We, we've done a lot of consumption-based greenhouse gas inventories for local governments for their local climate action plans. Um, the next category of work of highlights, Alan, it would be built environment. Um, I'm going to skip over this one because I know we, we talked about highlighting some built environment work a little later um, in the discussion, so I'm going to skip over that. Uh, the next one is material recovery and disposal. Uh, as, as, as you all know on the call, we had a pretty big um, market disruption a um, couple years ago um, that, that we're still dealing with. And out of that came a recycling steering committee um, uh, that that's um, charge was to modernize Oregon's recycling system. You know, we do have um, a recommendation, a consensus recommendation going coming out of that recycling steering committee and going to the legislature um, in the next legislative session to modernize Oregon's recycling system and um, extend uh, product responsibility um, upstream uh, further to the producers of products. So, so that's going to be an exciting um, program to see evolve. Um, after our funding was renewed in 2015, we were able to restart um, HHW collection events around the state. Um, so I know I and many others were happy to see that happen again. Um, we just had record turnout, uh, not surprisingly, at an HHW event. I think it was out in Sandy, Oregon, um, after you know, some of the devastating fires we've seen and all the HHW um, that, that we've had to deal with after that. Um, we also were fortunate to be able to start our school lab cleanout events again. I don't know, remember how many uh, school lab cleanouts we've done across the state, but we have done a, a lot, um, which is important work for our schools. Um, obviously, Opportunity to Recycle Act was, was, was expanded um, for Senate Bill 263, so there was a lot of work done in collaboration with local governments on, on how to expand those programs um, locally. Um, and then finally, we just did solid waste compliance, which is something that um, we've, we've always done and, is, and, is, and uh, has always been a part of our program. I wanted to highlight briefly some of the food work we've done. Um, on the commercial front, we've had a lot of different partners um, to partner uh, and put on workshops for you know, um, the restaurant industry and um, commercial food kitchens. Um, because you know, preventing the wasting of food is really important um, environmentally, um, and it, it really gives us a big bang for the buck. And so we've, we've partnered with a lot of people in that front. Um, also, have done a lot of work around residential food waste prevention. Um, and then finally, I, I, I would be remiss in if I didn't talk about some of our more community-based work. Um, we have we've had a great intern program over the last few years um, that's allowed us to place Oregon uh, graduate students at Oregon universities directly with businesses, which has been really exciting work, Alan, that I've been involved in personally. Um, and we've been able to make a lot of progress at certain Oregon businesses um, to advance sustainability. And then finally, last but not least, is certainly our grants program. Uh, fortunately, we were able to start up the grants again in 2015 um, and, uh, and been, been able to support projects around the state um, that have been doing really great things. I think an exciting part of our grant program too is that we've expanded um, to, the, to provide workforce development grants uh, to support the, the reuse and repair industry. Um, knowing that that's an important part of our you know, future in materials management is being able to extend the life of products and be able to support the businesses um, that, that support that industry. So, so that's been an exciting development. Um, sorry to go on so long, but uh, it's seven years of work is a, is a lot to cover, but um, I think I'll, I'll stop there for the moment. Well, it's, it's, it's a great, it's a re great recap. And I just want to throw out that grants. Everybody loves to have uh, grant money to, to get some seed money to start projects. And so for those of you who are still kind of in the business, or even maybe if you just know of opportunities that you'd like to see flower somewhere, you know, just keep an eye on the DEQ website uh, when they announce grants. I mean, we, we try to promote them as well as we can here in the county. So uh, it is a, it's a great thing. 
And I'm going to ask you another question, Jordan. I think I know the answer, but why did let you you tell me why did you guys decide to? I mean, this was a, this is an update. It was eight years ago, which is not that long ago. Yet it was a long time ago. So a lot has changed. So tell tell us about that. Why that happened? Sure. Yeah. It's it's important to <coughs> think about you know why did we update the framework? for action. And, um, you know, the, the first reason is pretty simple as that um, we wanted to fulfill our commitment to update the framework after six years. You know, I didn't talk a lot about the details of the first framework for action that came out in 2012, but it was basically a laundry list of 60 plus actions. Um, we, we, made, we made a lot of progress on those 60 actions. And, you know, when we looked back at those actions, we had been done active work on over 80% of those individual actions. One of those 60 actions was simply to update the framework after six years. So, so this was us making good on our commitments, saying, sure, we're going to look at the framework after six years and, and update it. So, so that's sort of the first reason why we did it. The, the second reason, Alan, um, it's just as important is that, you know, we just talked about how much um, at least DEQ's program has grown. Um, it, it was really important for us to, you know, take stock in our achievements and, and, and realign as needed. Um, it's, it's important to know, you know, for some people on the call, this may be the first time they've, they've heard about the updated framework for action. And it's really important for me to note that um, the update of the framework was largely an, an internal planning exercise to, to realign DEQ's program activities with achieving the goals of the 2050 vision. So this was not a big outwardly focused, you know, stakeholder outreach type of environment. It was, it was more of an inwardly focused, what are the programs that we're working on right now and, and how well aligned are they with achieving the 2050 vision? The first time around um, when we did the, the, the framework for action, it was a very detailed, in some cases, list of individual actions. And if, and if you think about just simply the title here, the framework for action, we, we really took that to heart this time around. And instead of listing a laundry list of actions, we, we truly updated the framework to be a framework. It, it was no longer a laundry list of actions. It, it, it was instead a, a framework for how the program was going to take action in the future. And, and we'll talk about that um, a little bit more. Um, and and I, I should say also that when we think about this as a, as a little bit more of an internal planning exercise, you know, as our program has grown, not many of the people that were newly hired in the program were here in 2012 as the, the 2050 vision was being developed. So just as far as the internal health of our own program, it was a really great opportunity for us to renew focus and attention on the 2050 vision and, and reinvest all of the new people in our own DEQ program, both at, at, at the headquarters staff and at the regional staff, in the 2050 vision. So this was a real, um, this was a really good team building exercise for us and a way for um, everybody in our program to see you know, where they fit within the 2050 vision. Okay, well, um, it, uh, I, I, that makes sense. And uh, so you guys have been doing all this stuff. You've, you've kind of taken stock of what you've done. So what's, What's new? You must have come up with, with now that you've got double the staff, you must, you must put them to work. So what, what are they going to do? What's new that we don't know about, Jordan? Sure. Um, I think I'll start by just talking about the new framework for action. Um, so the, the new framework for action serves, serves four important functions. Um, first, again, it serves as that flexible platform to guide progress towards the vision. Um, it identifies materials management priority work areas. Again, instead of listing individual actions, it says, here are the work areas that we wanna work in. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about these. It, art it articulates our core values and our guiding principles. Um, these core values are really important for us in figuring out not only what type of work we do, but within these different work areas, how we choose individual projects. Um, so these, these core, core values are new to us and, and we'll review those. And then finally, uh, the, the new framework for action really does provide a framework for others to apply a uh, sustainable materials management approach. Um, you know, we, we 
I want to remind people that you know the, the 2050 vision for Oregon, it, it's not DEQ's vision, um, it, it's Oregon's vision. And there's absolutely no way that we're ever going to achieve it if it's just DEQ working on it. And um, we certainly um, do not work on these things in isolation. We partner with local governments, with businesses, with um, nonprofits, you name it. Um, we're, we're, we're looking to expand our partnerships and we're looking to um, you know, enroll other folks in, in helping us achieve um, the, the 2050 vision for Oregon. Um, so we really hope that people look at the, 20, the fr new framework for action and maybe use it as a guide for their own program on, on how they, they organize their own work areas and, and where they, you know, choose partnerships and things like that. So I'll, I'll jump into a couple of the core values that are new to us. Um, I'm not going to uh, read through all of these, Alan, but um, I would just say that when we're talking about new projects or new work areas, or if I'm starting a presentation um, to a new group of stakeholders, when, when I start with our core values, when I start with what we care about, this is what we care about as a program, it really changes the conversation. It changes how you think about maybe traditional issues of you know, material recovery or landfilling. It changes how we think about how we consume materials and how where materials come from and how the workers are treated that are actually part of producing these materials or recovering these materials. So uh, the core values, um, you know, again, we, we only published this a few months ago. So these are still new to us and we're digesting them, but it really does change the dynamic of the conversation um, around the work that we choose to do. And, and, and with that work, I'm gonna just throw up here these, these priority uh, work areas on the screen. So we've divided our work areas into life cycle programs, community involvement, measurement, solid waste and recovery, and then finally emerging priorities. Within the framework for action, you'll find that each work area is clearly defined. We talk about what work, what exactly are we talking about when we're talking about built environment or procurement or product stewardship. We talk um, deeply about our rationale for working on it. Why is this work area important? And then finally, we talk about what we're doing, um, what we're currently doing. And then we also tip our hat to some of the future work that we'd like to do within each of these individual work areas. You know, Alan, I've worked in this program for 10 years. Um, this is the most comprehensive description of the work we do in the materials management program than I've ever seen. So if when we hire new employees, we now hand them the framework for action, the 2020 framework and say, here's a great description of what we do as a program. The same thing goes for when we're forming new stakeholders and new partnerships is that pe when people ask, well, what do we do? Again, I, I hand them the framework for action. I say, here is the breadth of the things that we do. Um, a lot of these um, work areas are familiar to some of you. And then um, finally, we, we really do leave a big gap for emerging priorities. You know, these, these are things that haven't become full priorities within our program. I think a good example here would be something like marine and freshwater plastics. You know, we, we see more and more of this. We, we get a lot of questions about it. We don't have an active program or research area working on this. But again, this is one of the emerging priorities that we see. Um, so I, I think the last thing that I'd say, um, Alan, and I'll, and I'll stop after this, is besides talking, uh, uh, you know, defining where we're working here, um, we also really do put out a call to action within the new framework. And, and this is where, again, we're saying we need partners to do this work. Um, you know, I think a lot of people, um, when we think about um, the state of the environment, both in Oregon and around the world, a lot of people are, are thinking that, wow, we, we kind of need to treat 2030 like the new 2050, um, because that's sort of the, um, the sense of urgency that I think many of us have within the environmental field is that, you know, we don't really have on the next 30 years to deal with some of these environmental issues. We, we, we kind of need to deal with them within the next 10. And so there, there really is this sense of urgency. I, I know at least within the people that work in our program that um, we do want to have this call to action. We do want new partnerships. We do want new new energy around this type of work. Okay, so you've got that laundry list there, and it's a that's a, a, a pretty big chunk. Where is it? Where do you have? Where do you fit in? You must have a section of this somewhere. 
Sure. Yeah. I, I, um, I spend most of my time focused on the built environment. And, you know, we define the built environment as buildings and infrastructure, um, which makes this program area quite broad. Um, we were recently <coughs> fortunate enough um, to hire another staff member. Uh, her name is Amanda Ingmeyer, and uh, she is also tag teaming with me on built environment work. And, um, you know, we both focus on buildings and infrastructure. Um, we do not yet have a strategic plan for the built environment, but that's something that we're currently working on. I think at DEQ, you could um, expect to see more strategic plans coming out for these individual priority work areas. And when we think about where and how we involve stakeholders, it's at the strategic plan level is, is really when we wanna reach out to those stakeholders and say, hey, within the built environment, here's what we're thinking about working on. What do you think? You know, how can DEQ support the work that you're doing? How could we complement the work that you're doing? So anyway, that's, that's, that's where you might expect to see more of us um, is at the strategic plan level, reaching out to stakeholders. Um, there's a lot that we're doing within the built environment, um, Alan, and, and I think I'll just uh, highlight these two um, bolded uh, items here. One is, you know, small housing initiatives. Um, I was a new employee to, to the program when the 2050 vision um, was, was being adopted. And I was fortunate enough to, to work on some of these small housing issues. Um, this is a good example of how some of the foundational research we did around residential green building um, really did lead to some successful work at the local and the state level. Um, some of the outcomes of our work on small housing initiatives was that we saw a sharp increase in the number of built accessory dwelling units, also known as ADUs, um, in the Portland area. We saw local zoning code changes um, around the state, um, uh, including Salem. Um, we saw a first of its kind survey of ADU owners. We you know, published financing guides, uh, appraisal guides. We helped sponsor home tours, educational videos. We, we held large educational conferences. And, and, and I'd say, you know, we really learned a lot from doing this work. Um, you know, we learned that, you know, we really do um, value basing our actions on solid research. And um, you'll see this as a theme again and again in our program. And I think a lot of people do look to us to provide that foundational research. Um, and uh, like all projects, having strong relationships with stakeholders was, was really critical to this project. Um, we, you know, learned the, uh, the value of being opportunistic and trying new pathways, you know, at first while doing small housing work and promoting small housing in a way, as a way to, you know, reduce material use, um, and reduce environmental impacts. It, it felt very strange to me to be reaching out to banks to talk about financing options and uh, for smaller housing models. Says, you know, at the end of the day, I'm an environmental scientist, you know, um, I, and here I was reaching out to banks. But um, eventually it felt normal to, to break out of our traditional box and simply make things happen. Um, and uh, so that was really exciting work to do. And the other part of this project is that it, it felt good that we learned how to, you know, some of in, how to embed some of our objectives into others. Because, um, you know, we, we have a small staff and um, in this particular case for the small housing initiatives, um, you know, eventually this type of work was picked up by many other local governments. And now we actually have state law that requires single family zones to allow accessory dwelling units throughout the state that, that passed just a couple of years ago. So um, it allowed us as DEQ to kind of step away and, and work on some other projects. One of those other projects I'll quickly highlight and you alluded to um, was concrete. Um, you know, we have, a, we have a partnership with the Oregon Concrete and Aggregate Producers Association. You know, Alan, we, we help concrete producers across the state um, develop work called environmental product declarations. They're also known as EPDs. These are third party verified labels. Um, they measure and disclose environmental impacts of a product. And you, you could kind of think of them like a nutrition facts label, like, like we see in the, the image here, um, but they're not on food, you know, they're on building products. And these EPDs really serve two main functions. Um, they help manufacturers identify hotspots in their production. And uh, they also um, help consumers choose, lo choose lower impact products. Um, so I, I, I wanna review just a little bit some of the outcomes of this work and, uh, and I'll wrap up this, this concrete discussion. Um, you know, we've helped 
pub, uh, concrete producers publish over a thousand EPDs around the state from 20 different concrete plants, again, across the state. We've helped at least one producer identify numerous process improvements at their plant that will not only save them money, but also lower their environmental impacts. Um, now that we have these EPDs out on the market, um, we've been able to work with um, local governments to help them um, develop policies that actually <coughs> require EPDs and allow them to lower the impacts of, of their procurement. Um, and, you know, this, um, the city of Portland's concrete procurement policy, you know, in short, we, we worked with them. They now require EPDs on all public purchasing of concrete within the city of Portland. Um, over the next six months, we're working with the city of Portland to um, help publish what are called global warming potential thresholds. This will, this will actually set a limit saying, not only do you need an EPD to sell concrete to the city of Portland, but the carbon footprint of that concrete cannot be above X. So they're actually setting a limit on how much carbon they, they deem ex, um, acceptable within their purchases. Um, and then that will be um, implemented January 1st of 2022. Um, the last thing I'll say, which I think will hopefully be uh, very helpful for other maybe local governments on the call is a um, pilot project that we just ran this summer with the city of Portland. Um, we're hoping to publish this um, by the end of the month. This is just the cover of um, the case study that we put together. But basically we took um, a bunch of ADA sidewalk ramps and, and poured low carbon concrete mixes um, throughout the city of Portland and um, did a blind pilot test with the concrete finishers and tested not only the performance and the strength, but also the finishability um, of these mixes with the concrete finishers themselves and tested whether or not this was a viable option to implement across the city of Portland. And for that matter, across the state. Um, we've, it, was a very, it was a very successful pilot project and we found that these low carbon concrete mixes were very viable. And I'm really excited to be able to share this case study with other local governments so they could start implementing this you know, in their own jurisdictions. Uh, so I think I'll stop there, Alan, as, as far as um, highlighting some of the work that we were doing in the built environment. It's, you know, it's amazing, uh, Jordan, to think about this. Uh, um, probably nobody that's uh, signed on for this webinar expected to be chatting about, hearing you chat about, um, you know, carbon and concrete, yet um, it has a pretty big, big impact. I mean, I think about every, every, just about everything that's in the built environment, you know, somewhere has some concrete. You may not be able to see it, but it's probably, you know, holding the building up, right? So it's, uh, it's a, it's, fairly ubiquitous, but uh, that's just an interesting thing. Um, so knowing, I mean, I know you don't have a, a crystal ball, but uh, uh, if you did have one, what would you expect to, might happen in the future with all this, this, uh, this built environment in the future or, or anything else with this 2020 framework, just kind of growing out of it, uh, looking down the road? Because, you know, everything you're talking about here is really good stuff, Jordan. It's encouraging. I find it uplifting, you know, in this, these days where it seems like the environment is on just being beleaguered on all fronts. Um, to see that there's, a, there's, there's concrete, pardon the pun, ways to, to work out of this or to at least uh, go at it. So um, give us more hope, man. <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, yeah, I, thanks for that, Alan. And I, I do, you know, want to put people's attention back back to this 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 concrete for a moment because this this is one of the reasons why we're focusing on it is that you know this is low hanging fruit this is this is work that anybody can be doing around the state um, if you are a local government and you pour sidewalks um, this is work that that you can be doing right now you know we have the available materials we have the available technology and in most cases these are cost neutral opportunities to pour low carbon concrete um, within your jurisdiction um, and so, yeah, th these are these are great opportunities um, right now. And and so that's part of I think what we're trying to focus on also in the built environment is you know what what can be done now. Um, so so this is the the, the sidewalks is uh, is one of these things, and we really wanted to start with something simple that can really be relatable to to everybody. And you know what was kind of eye opening to me in this particular pilot project was you know. 
I, I knew we would be able to lower the carbon content, in this case, by upwards of 40% on an individual ADA sidewalk ramp. But, you know, some of these ADA requirements are, you know, requirements across the state. You know, the city of Portland, they, they replace literally thousands of sidewalks, um, these, these sidewalk ramps on an annual basis. When they looked at the potential um, uh, from one sidewalk extrapolated to thousands, they figured out that this would have this would be equivalent of you know cutting the emissions from the energy use of all of their street and traffic lights by about thirty percent. Um, so this is we're talking about big savings here, and we're talking about these savings within the realm of materials. Um, not many people think about savings that way, and I think when when we think about local climate action plans, when we think about what can be done now. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of things um, that can be done uh, on, on the material side of things. So when we do look into our crystal ball for the future of built environment, I'm going to bring this slide up again, Alan. And um, I, I highlighted the executive order um, 1720. Um, this was a, a governor's executive order that mainly focused on increasing energy efficiency in both public and private buildings. Um, there was one part of this executive order passed a few years ago um, that also focused on embodied carbon of building materials. It said it, new state buildings um, need to focus, need to work with Oregon DEQ to reduce the embodied carbon of their building materials. So right now, um, uh, Amanda and I are, are acting like project consultants on a number of state building projects where we are working with the engineering, with the architecture and design team and helping them lower the carbon impacts of the building materials that they specify on their projects. This is a, a service that we're providing to state building projects. We're really excited about this because it's, it's, it's making a difference on the ground at these individual projects. And it's also helping raise the capacity for other people to do this work. Um, so I do invite you to contact um, uh, me or Amanda, if you have a public building project that um, is large and might need some assistance. Um, no, no guarantee that we're going to have the capacity to help out every local government, but I do want to put that out there um, just because I, I think it's important work and we're really interested in raising the capacity to do this type of work across the state. Um, I, I want to highlight our grants program. Um, everybody loves our grants program, including me. Uh, some of our grants from the built environment sector um, from last round are in including finding, you know, new markets for some of um, the juniper wood that we see being harvested from uh, central and eastern Oregon. Um, that's, that's important work that not only, you know, helps um, uh, landowners, but also helps the ecosystem as far as um, juniper goes. And um, also in, in looking forward to raising the capacity to, to conduct, you know, whole building life cycle assessments. Um, which allows people to, to look at the impacts of their building materials and then, and then lower them over time. We're gonna be holding some workshops uh, in December and January that will be free to architects and engineers who are looking to do that type of work. And, and then finally, my, my crystal ball is that I, I don't wanna to project too far as far as our built environment work because we are starting a strategic planning process right now. And um, because it's like a candy store that we, we work in, right? There's so much that we could possibly be doing within the built environment that we really do need to stop and, and, and focus our efforts. Um, and so we are going starting a strategic planning effort to figure out, do we wanna be working on building code? Do we wanna be working on zoning code? Um, do we need to be doing more education or more consulting on individual projects? So, so these are things that when we have a staff of two people working on the built environment, um, we really do need to sit down and focus our efforts. And so that's why we are going through some strategic planning. Um, so that's, that's a little bit of reflection, Alan, on just uh, the built environment aspect of it. Um, and uh, I, I hope I gave you a little bit of hope. I know that's how you pitched it. I'm happy to talk a little bit more broadly about materials management um, at large. And so I'll, I'll stop there and see what other questions and discussion we have. Okay, well, I, we do have a few uh, folks have written in a couple things, and one of them kind of, I'll, I'll just stay on the concrete um, questions first. Uh, somebody wrote, uh, Michael wrote, uh, exactly what is the ingredient list telling me? My assumption is that this is a carbon footprint of producing. 
So it'd be the, is, is that right? Is that the, it's, it's actually, is it, is it all on how much uh, that impact has as a, as a production upstream from, you know, you, before you buy it? Or is it, is it also included? I guess, I think that might be what he's asking. Um, <laughs> yeah. You look at that. List. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, yeah, the, um, the, the EPDs, those, those labels that I was talking about, um, they measure the environmental impacts of producing ready mix concrete. And so uh, they, they're often called cradle to gate emissions, which means that we're measuring the, the impact of harvesting raw materials, transporting those materials um, to a manufacturer, and then finally um, producing that material and driving it to the factory gate. So we stop measuring once that truck leaves the gate of its ready mix plant. Um, and when we think about concrete, 90 plus percent of the environmental impacts of concrete are in producing it, right? Um, concrete does not have a in carbon impact when it's actually in place and being used. It's, it's an inert material that's not doing anything. Um, the, the same thing goes for when it's in a landfill. Um, there are not many demolition related impacts of demolishing concrete on a sidewalk or a building foundation. And when you um, either recycle concrete um, and displace aggregate. There's a very small environmental benefit for that because uh, mining aggregate does not have large impacts um, compared to, um, as well as you know, disposing of concrete in a landfill. Again, from a carbon perspective, um, it's an inert material that is not producing greenhouse gas emissions when put in a landfill. So th the point here is that yes, 90 plus percent of the impacts of concrete are in producing the material and the labels that we're working for um, are working with concrete producers on how to produce a lower impact material to begin with. And um, what we know about concrete, the long story short is that, um, you know, 90% of the impact in ready mix concrete is in the cement. You know, the cement is the glue that holds all the rocks together. And uh, we produce cement by baking limestone at very, very high temperatures and very high energy consuming kilns. And so when we use less cement and when we use more products like uh, slag or fly ash or some other products on the market, um, that's the way that we reduce the carbon footprint of ready mix concrete. So the, the, the pilot project you guys did was with was on, um, sidewalks. Uh, somebody asked, could, would this, is there, are there materials like this that could be used for a residential driveway? A absolutely, yeah. Wherever you pour concrete, you have the ability to um, use a low carbon mix. Um, the, the biggest barrier we have to using low carbon concrete mixes is that they simply take a little bit longer to cure. So if you were to, you know, put form work up for, let's say, a residential driveway or a foundation or whatever it may be, you know, normally if you were to pour a, a mix of just a standard concrete mix with 100% cement, you'd be able to pull that form work off after maybe a day or two. Um, now, when you have these low carbon mixes that have less cement, um, you would take a little bit longer before you could pull that form work off, let's say two or three or four days. So really the only financial related impact that is possible with these low carbon mixes is it, how it affects your schedule, right? If it affects your schedule and delays your project, then that's one of the reasons why people don't use low carbon mixes. So when we're talking about residential foundations or driveways, it's going to have virtually no effect on your project schedule. And there's no reason why we shouldn't be using low carbon mixes across the state. And have you ever used or heard about hempcrete? I guess it's a hemp project uh, product. It's supposed to have a, a, a negative carbon footprint is what was written here. Do you know sure. anything about those? Yeah, I, I've certainly heard of hempcrete. Um, hempcrete is, is, used as a, um, is used as a building material itself, or in some cases, an insulation material. Um, I can't speak to the, the negative uh, carbon uptake of hempcrete. Um, I haven't studied that specifically. 
Um, so, right, I, I, uh, it's, I, I can't, I haven't used it myself. I haven't really seen it be used in Oregon. What, what I do know about it is that um, typically, you know, when we think about the hemp industry here, you know, um, the type of hemp that is appropriate to be used for a building material um, is typically not the type of hemp um, that is being grown here in Oregon. You know, a lot of the, the hemp here in Oregon is not industrial hemp used for, for fiber. Uh, it's instead being, you know, grown for the flower and for the, the marijuana and THC aspects of it. Um, so to the best of my knowledge, we're not growing the right type of hemp to be used as a building material here in Oregon. I'd be happy to be wrong about that. Um, but uh, most of these building, these sort of alternative uh, building materials are, are not very widespread in, in use, um, to the best of my knowledge. Okay. And I've got another question here about um, could uh, somebody that runs a, uh, a, a master's program says could, could MBA students be in your intern program? Would they be good candidates for that? Yes. Yeah, I'd encourage you to go to um, our website. <clears throat> um, it's called OASIS, the Oregon Applied Sustainability Experience. It's a partnership between Oregon Sea Grant and Oregon DEQ. Um, we're actually typically using EPA funding to place students directly with businesses. Um, I think we had a student within the economics program um, be placed last semester. Um, and so we've had engineering students, we've had environmental science students. Um, I don't think, uh, I think it's a pretty wide, wide program. And so I'd encourage you to, to check that out um, if you are a business student and if you have interest in um, uh, teaming up with Oregon businesses. Okay. And I've got another question here from Carol who asked, uh, will DEQ be proposing specific legislation to address the goals of the materials management program? Question mark. Grants provide the carrot incentives. Will there also be a stick incentive uh, given the urgency of climate change? Okay. Um, so there is a few different questions in there. Um, the, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the only legislation um, that I'm aware of right now is the, is the consensus-based legislation coming out, uh, the legislative concepts coming out of the Recycling Steering Committee. Um, those are mainly focused on um, packaging and extended producer responsibility programs um, uh, that, that, um, that are focused on the types of curbside materials that we find. So again, this is, this is sort of a very, this is a subsection of our total uh, flow of materials um, within the waste stream. Um, so that is the only legislation I'm aware of that um, is coming through the materials management program and through the governor's office and hopefully we'll, we'll see it at the legislature. Um, as far as the, the carrot and stick approach, as far as climate change goes, um, you know, through the, the governor recently issued an executive order called uh, Executive Order 2004 that was focused on climate change. And, and this executive order was basically in response to what was now, what are we now, two or three times, you know, failed legislation at the state level for cap and invest. Um, and part of that legislation, uh, part of that executive order directs Oregon DEQ's um, air quality climate program to do a cap program. So it actually um, directs us to start um, limiting greenhouse gas emissions um, through permitted sources. Um, we, we've always required permitted sources above a certain level to report their greenhouse gas emissions. And this will be the first time we're starting a rulemaking that will actually start limiting those greenhouse gas emissions. So that is the um, stick approach. To the best of my knowledge, I, I, I'm not in the air quality program, so I don't know the details of this, but my understanding is that we do not currently have the authority to um, you know, have uh, you know, funds from people paying um, 
into a program be reinvested into this, you know, the, the traditional cap and invest program, where if you pay to pollute, um, that money actually goes into Oregon economy to lower greenhouse gas emissions in other parts. So I think that's part of what we may be losing in um, not having full cap and invest legislation. But I know our air quality program is moving forward with that. Um, as far as other climate related legislation goes, I would encourage you to check out the agency reports um, that the governor's office required for executive order 2004. Um, there were many different suggestions being floated there by different um, organizations, by different state agencies. You know, I know um, we helped work with DAS to recommend some, some ideas around procurement about, you know, as we as state agencies procure things like building materials, how can we um, procure lower carbon building materials? So there's a few ideas sprinkled in there about potential um, legislation, but as, as probably many of you know, all, all state sponsored legislation does cycle through the governor's office. So, um, and, and that process I think is starting now. So um, that's all that I'm aware of at, at the moment. Yeah, and I just like to toss out that, you know, uh, one of the ways that the government has a big stick is that the purchasing power of federal, state, and local governments is enormous. Um, and so, for example, you know, the, just in Oregon, um, the, the fact that people are using pretty much ubiquitously everywhere you look, 30% um, recycled content, if not 100% recycled content, and just in their paper, for example. And so that, that means that it helps drive those markets toward using more fiber, uh, reusing fiber into, the, into their, in their pulp uh, to make paper that's you know, going to be used basically a very short time. So that's, that's one of the ways that uh, that can be directed. So the purchasing power is, is certainly a great opportunity for the government to help drive those uh, policies that they want to see happen. Well. Jordan, I think we've run out of questions, but uh, it's, been a, it's been a great uh, presentation on your part. I appreciate very much that you've taken the time to be here with us today. And as I told everybody that this uh, webinar will appear on YouTube and I'm gonna figure out a way to turn into a radio show too. So um, again, I appreciate everybody coming on this beautiful Wednesday. The sun now here in Salem is just glowing. And uh, also, Jordan, I just want to pass on that the city of Salem is working on a climate action plan here. Um, I'm, I'm going to be sitting in on that with that group there. And so you know, I, I'm sure we'll be um, getting in touch with you about that, uh, uh, tapping on you for saying, hey, so here's something we could do. We could require some of this low carbon concrete. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and I, I did get a question from John about uh, uh, the fires. I'm going to save that for another day, John. Um, that's, a, that's a whole other topic. And uh, well, well, we, we can chat about that, that later. And uh, again, I appreciate that. And uh, the PowerPoint will be available. It will be visually on the, uh, uh, you'll be able to see it on um, the YouTube video. Although I guess Jordan, if you wanted to make it available, we could uh, we could put that out as a uh, put out a PDF and let folks look at it. Should we do that? Sure. Okay. Yeah, I'd be happy to send it to you. Okay. Thanks. So I'll I'll send that out to everybody. Once it gets uh, loaded onto YouTube, it'll be coming your way. Okay. Well, thank you all. Uh, appreciate it. And again, Jordan, uh, kudos to you and your group. And uh, thank you very much. And you guys all have a great day. Thanks so much, Alan. Take care, everyone. Thank you.